And I'm, I'm not sure, I hope, um, I'm not sure this is state of the art because everybody has, seems to know more about this argument than I do. Um, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, I made these slides. I don't know how helpful they'll be. And I'm really not sure how much I'll follow them or what I've, what I've, or what I've written here. Um, let me try. See how much progress I can make in half an hour. Um, so, I've never used one of these before. Did I just switch it off? You might have just switched it off. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Ah, there you go. Okay. So Elvin Plantinga sketches the following argument for the existence of God. Um, I think uh, the paragraph can be distilled into the following. Um, it seems plausible to think of numbers as dependent upon or even constituted by intellectual activity. So if there are no minds, there'd be no numbers. But there are too many of them, too many numbers, uh, for them to arise as a result of human intellectual activity. And so we should think of them as among God's ideas. Okay. That is the um, argument from numbers. Um, but I'll start, I don't start over here, but I'll start now with um, something not entirely different. Um, immediately after presenting the argument from numbers, um, I don't know what's up on the next slide. Ah, great. Um, Plantinga presents um, a similar argument about properties. Um, there's also a similar argument about properties. He says, properties seem very similar to concepts. Is there really a difference between thinking of the things that fall under the concept horse and considering the things that have the property of being a horse? In fact, many have found it natural to think of properties as reified concepts. But again, there are properties one wants to say that have never been entertained by any human being. And it also seems wrong to think that properties do not exist before human beings conceive of them. But then, with respect to these considerations, it seems likely that properties are the concepts of an unlimited mind. Um, I, um, I think there's another argument to be had from properties, and, and, and one that doesn't um, construe properties as concepts. Um, I, um, the, the, the argument um, is, um, is had in Jonathan Lowe's um, work and um, can be set out in very broad outline in terms of a couple of premises and a conclusion. Um, it's connected to the argument from numbers um, because the properties that Lowe has in mind are, he takes it, numbers. And some of the same moves in the, in the argument from properties will end up, I think, in forming an argument from numbers. Um, the broad outline of the argument runs like this. Some abstract beings, again, he has in mind properties, and he construes numbers as properties, necessarily exist. Abstract beings necessarily depend on concrete beings for their existence, and so there must be some concrete being. Um, properties enter the scene in the first premise. Numbers are supposed to be the necessary ingredients of the necessary truths of mathematics. And Lowe takes numbers again to be properties, in particular properties of sets. Single-membered sets instantiate the number one, double-membered sets instantiate the number two, and so on. Yeah. Um, there, are some, there are some advantages, he thinks, um, over the more popular position that numbers are to be construed in terms of sets. But um, in fact, I don't think it will matter for the argument if we do take numbers to be closer to sets. Um, that brings us to the second premise. Um, that premise is based on three principles. Um, I hope I have this in order. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> took a while for me to figure out how to do that. <laughs> took even longer for me to figure out how to do that and to get it to run around. OK, it didn't run as much as I was hoping. OK. <laughs> OK, three, three principles that this, this um, argument depends upon for that second premise. OK. Um, that is that um, abstract beings depend on concrete beings. 
um, that the only possible abstract beings are sets and properties. That sets must depend on non-sets as their ultimate elements. Okay, so maybe you, we can have a set that has a, as its member a set that has its as its member a set, but in the end, it's got to bottom off in non-sets. Okay, they, so there can't be any empty sets. Okay, or any pure sets, nothing like that. Doesn't countenance anything like that. And um, then a similar principle for properties. Properties must bottom off on non-properties. There can't be any platonic universals or properties floating free. Okay. Now, um, forget, forget how these principles are supported. You won't be convinced, I say. So long as you think other kinds of abstract beings or the empty set or uninstantiated universals are so much as possible, so much as possible, you won't be convinced by this argument. Um, but still, that's how the rest goes. Um, assume sets or properties could have existed alone, then the sets would depend on the properties. Okay. The, the sets might have sets, might have sets that have properties as their members. Those would be the only ingredients on the scene. Okay. Um, for the sets to ultimately bottom out, about, bottom out in. And the properties would depend on the sets. Okay. For their ultimate instantiations. And he thinks that that's an impossible circle of dependence. You get the, you get the sets depending on the properties and the pro properties depending on the sets. Okay. Um, that's what we land in if we think that abstract beings could exist alone. Um, an impossible circle of dependence. So we should conclude that, conclude that abstract beings couldn't have existed alone. Okay. That's to say, abstract beings depend on con concrete beings for their existence. Uh, not sure what to skip over. Okay, okay. Abstract beings, whether construed as properties or sets, are not possible without concrete beings. Since abstract beings are necessary beings, there must be some concrete beings or other. Some concrete beings or other. Okay. The abstract beings um, might depend on cats. If the cats didn't exist, the abstract beings would depend on dogs. Um, as it stands, the, the argument doesn't point towards any particular necessary concrete being. Make sense? OK, OK. But as it turned out, in the end, Lowe was, in fact, keen on the ontological arguments. I'm getting a call. Somebody here calling me? It's like a Texas number. OK. Made a, have I made a mistake so far? I just want to <laughs> <put your> hand. <laughs> Tempted to answer it. OK. And he, he, he subsequently developed his argument into uh, what he called a modal ontological argument, though it doesn't have much uh, um, resemblance to the more familiar modal ontological argument of Alvin Plantinga's. Um, um, just, just reject the option that the necessary abstract beings could depend on contingent concrete beings. Um, that, that idea is weird. And uh, he puts the objection like this. Um, to contend that the existence of a necessary being in is explained in different possible worlds by different contingent beings in those worlds threatens to undermine the very necessity of N's existence. For then it would appear to be a mere cosmic accident that every possible world happens to contain something that is allegedly able to explain the existence of N in that world. Okay? Um, an accident in the cosmo I that's the correct pronunciation of possible worlds, um, is, a, is even a less likely than any ordinary um, cosmic accident. But um, why would it be? Why would it be a cosmic accident that every world contains a concrete being? I suspect that's because nothing is preventing the non-existence of all concrete beings. We can't explain why there had to be concrete beings in terms of, uh, contingent beings in terms of other contingent beings, and we can't explain it in terms of the necessary being other, since the necessary being is supposed to depend on the country, concrete being. In turn, um, and I think there's a similar problem with the original argumentative context in which Lowe um, 
frame that, that, that original argument. He didn't, he didn't first put it as an argument for the conclusion that there's a necessary concrete being, only for the conclusion that there had to be some concrete beings or other. And he was there trying to explain why there is anything at all, why there is something rather than nothing, something concrete, okay. rather than nothing concrete. Lowe answered that there had to have existed some concrete being or other, even while there might not have been any necessary concrete being. However, we can't explain concrete beings in terms of abstract beings if those abstract beings depend on the concrete beings in turn. That's an impossible circle of dependence. There being necessary abstract beings might entail there necessarily being concrete beings, which entails there being concrete beings in turn, but entailment isn't always at least explanation. So settle with a, a, con a necessary concrete being instead, and as it turns out, Lowe thought um, it should be a necessary intellect, and he ends up taking abstract beings to depend on intellectual activity. Oh, I think this is going to jump a little further. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, just like Plantinga does. I think the arguments are very close. Um, I'll quote Lowe at some length. A clue here is provided by the very expression of abstract. An abstract being is one which by its very nature is in some sense abstracted from, literally drawn out of or away from, from something else. Any such being may reasonably be supposed to depend for its existence on that from which it is abstracted. All the most plausible examples of abstract beings are, interestingly enough, entities that are in a broad sense objects of reason. Such entities as numbers, sets, propositions. But then we have a very good candidate for the sort of being from which such entities may be supposed to be somehow abstracted, namely a mind of some kind. Putting these thoughts together, that necessary, that necessary abstract beings, insofar as they are objects of reason, are mind dependent. And secondly, that they are dependent for their existence on a necessary contract, concrete being, we are led to the conclusion that the being in question must be a rational being with a mind, and indeed, with a mind so powerful that it can comprehend all of mathematics and logic. Um, so I think Lowe ends up developing this argument from properties numbers, construing numbers as properties, to an argument that is very similar to, um, to Plantinga's argument from numbers. Uh, in more way than one, um, it's connected to the argument of nu from numbers, but, but it doesn't depend on the existence of numbers, let alone their necessary existence. The necessary existence of any abstract being, numbers, sets, propositions, would do. Um, Lowe doesn't have much more than Plantinga does about how to say about how abstract beings depend on intellectual activity, and I want to see if I can develop that and work it out a little. Um, so to remind ourselves, um, I don't know if I remind ourselves here, yeah, though it might take a little while to go back. How was Plantinga's? Oh no, I have to do all this again? Oh, I regret this already. Oh, why did I do this? I can hardly re backtrack and go, oh. no, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna backtrack. This is gonna take forever if I don't do that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm just proud of these animals. That's why I'm doing it again. I'm going to go back and forward a lot of times. You'll see. Okay. Okay. I, I want to. Um, I want to extend um, Plantinga's argument. Um, it, it's it's an argument that to me is reminiscent in some way of Barclay's. Just as, just as the phenomenal world is supposed to outstrip our intellectual capacities. I mean, where do, um, where do tables go when we aren't looking at them? Um, so too, the mathematical world is supposed to outstrip our intellectual capacities. And, and in both cases, we're appealing to uh, an infinite mind to do the work. Um, but um, um, we, we can assume, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm, I'm going to just assume some of um, some of the premises of the argument and try to develop it a little further. Let's, let's assume that numbers do depend on intellectual activity. No intellectual activity, no numbers. 
Let's also assume that there are too many numbers for any finite intellectual activity to do the work. No infinite intellectual activity, no numbers. If there are numbers, then there must be infinite intellectual activity. Quite some assumptions and quite some conclusion. Still, it doesn't give us a very religious conclusion. The infinite intellectual activity, for all we know, may be done by something or some things less than God. Okay, maybe it could be distributed among an infinite number of quite puny intellects. Um, I want to take things further and push for a necessary being and a single, a unity, single being. Am I going too quickly, too slowly? Is this okay? Trent? You're doing great. Well, okay, 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 okay. I just, I don't know. I'm not looking up so much, so I don't know if they're like frowns. Maybe I shouldn't look up. So first, a necessary being. Let's assume that numbers are the ingredients or truth makers for mathematical truths. They're what mathematical truths are about. In fact, let's assume that they're necessarily the ingredients. It's not just that they happen to be the ingredients. However things had turned out, nothing else could have done the job. For example, rocks couldn't have had much more to do with the fact that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Let's also assume that mathematical truths are necessar necessarily true. But if numbers are the essential ingredients of mathematical truths and that are necessarily true, then numbers must necessarily exist. Given our assumptions, then numbers do necessarily exist. So, so we already have some necessary beings on the scene, but from here we can get to necessary intellectual activity easily. Let's assume that numbers not only depend on intellectual activity, but that they necessarily so depend. It's not just that they happen to depend on intellectual activity. However things had turned out, nothing else could do the job. Rocks couldn't have had much more to do with numbers. Numbers would depend on something tamer if they could. Um, but if numbers necessarily depend on intellectual activity and necessarily exist, then intellectual activity necessarily exists. Now we have necessary intellectual activity on the scene. And where there's intellectual activity, there's an intellect. For all that's been said, though, the intellectual activity need not be the intellectual activity of a necessary intellect. However things had turned out, there had to be intellectual activity. And so there had to be some intellect or other, but maybe no particular intellect had to exist. If things had turned out one way, then a certain intellect, Barry, um, uh, would be on the scene. Um, but if things had turned out another way, there'd be maybe another intellect on the scene, a Mandy. Barry wouldn't exist at all. Okay? Um, we can push, though, I think, for a necessary intellect and, and, and appealing to the sort of moves that Jonathan Lowe makes. Um, since if there were no necessary intellect, the numbers could depend on different intellects, possibly Ban Barry, possibly on Mandy. Um, but numbers are necessary beings, while the intellects are contingent beings. And so that would mean that necessary beings end up depending on contingent beings. And as we've seen, that's puzzling. Suppose the relevant contingent intellect, say Barry, didn't exist. Then, to secure the necessary existence of numbers, Mandy would have to exist in his place. The existence of numbers would be preventing the non-existence of intellects. The numbers would be forcing, so to speak, some intellect or other into being. So the intellect would depend on the numbers, even while the numbers depend on the intellect, which is, again, an impossible circle of dependence. This makes sense? Sort of? OK. Um, so now we have a necessary intellect on the scene, um, and an intellect infinite enough to generate the infinity of numbers, though not necessarily all-knowing. It might be natural to think of such po a powerful intellect um, as knowing of other things. After all, punier intellects do have knowledge of various categories and come along with other, with other things besides, from will to spatiotemporality. However, I say the analogy wouldn't be very good and not entirely wanted. Um, so, so far as the argument from numbers goes, I don't see any way to bridge this gap from the knowledge of the numbers or more broadly necessary truths to uh, omniscience. Okay. Um, I do think, though, that, that, the, um, that we can push towards another divine attribute, and that is um, unity. But um, on my way here, 
yesterday on my way to Waco, I, I, I realized that um, I realized that my little argument for that, which I was quite proud of, depends upon or has as a consequence that there is a biggest number. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd better not present that now. This isn't the biggest number. <laughs> this is how many minutes you've got left. I'm seven minutes? Okay. Jeez. <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, so I've got, this is overdetermined. I've got more than one reason to, um, to, skip, um, to skip that little argument. Okay. <laughs> Should have just banked on that. Okay, oh, so objections. I, I, I have a few objections. Oh, gosh, I haven't. Come on. Oh, I missed all of this. Oh. Okay, well, you can see how good it would have been. Okay, skip unity. Problems. Let me, let me present a few problems and hopefully maybe Trent will give me eight minutes or something, you know. I'm the first star, things are a little shaky. Um, okay. The view developed has various advantages over run-of-the-mill psychologism, which construes numbers as human ideas. That just won't do for reasons owing ultimately to Frege. If numbers are human ideas, then there'll be too few of them since each of us is finite and there aren't enough of us. If numbers are human ideas, then there won't be any number greater than the greatest number we've thought up. Here's another problem, at least close to one put forward by Leibniz about necessary truths generally. If numbers are human ideas, then numbers, and mathematics, which has numbers as its essential ingredients, would be just as contingent as we are. But there are enough numbers, and numbers greater than any we've had, and they're not contingent. These points are at work in the argument for divine psychologism that I ran through, um, and we can avoid them with a necessary divine intellect. But there are two problems raised by Frege I'm not so sure of. I'm not so sure how serious the problems are or whether divine psychologism avoids them. The first is about privacy. Oh, come on, Trent, this is true. Okay. If numbers are ideas and ideas are private to thinkers, then, they will each, then the, we will each have our own numbers. Quoting Frege, we should have to speak of ma two and your two, of one two and two twos. Okay, if only Dr. Seuss wrote the whole, <laughs> the whole thing. Um, if the number two is a divine idea, is it any less private um, than if it's a human idea? Maybe. If two is a human idea, then presumably it's as much my idea as yours. You're not especially privileged such that we're all talking about your idea. But if it's a divine idea, then we could all be talking about the same idea, God's idea. Divine ideas would have to be relevantly different from our own, and they're at least different in that they can secure the infinity and necessity of numbers. So then arises the problem of how we make cognitive contact with numbers. The problem is really tricky if we have a platonic heaven of impotent numbers. It might be a little tr less tricky if the numbers are in actual heaven. God could be powerful enough to forge the connection that allows us to talk about his ideas. Leibniz thought as much. In any case, we might have answered that there is enough similarity between our ideas for them to all be counted as the number of two, even if they're not so strictly identical. So I'm not so sure of the original problem to begin with. Trent, I have two more minutes or something? I have four minutes. <sighs> okay, all this, these numbers are. So the second problem for Frege, uh, from Frege, I think is more serious. This is a kind of contingency problem. It's not about the numbers being contingent, but about the mathematical truths that result from them being contingent. Quoting Frege, as new generations of children grow up, new generations of twos would continually be being born. And in the course of millennia, these might evolve, for all we could tell, to such a pitch that two of them would make five. If numbers are human ideas, then mathematics is as contingent as we are and as our thinking is. Now two plus two happens to equal four, but if we come to think differently, it would equal five. And if we had thought differently, it uh, would have equaled five, which is absurd. We might think that divine psychologism can answer the problem as easily as it can answer the early problem about the contingency of numbers themselves. The necessary nature of the divine, of the numbers, as well as their necessary existence, could be secured by the necessity of the divine intellect. And we might be right. But it's not clear that either problem is solved. It could be that God would always have had the idea of two and four, and it could be that God would always have had the idea that two plus two equals four, no matter what. 
but perhaps it could be that God would not necessarily have the ideas. Why should he have them? If God could have had quite different ideas or none at all, it would be a cosmic coincidence for him to choose just those ideas, no matter what. Okay. Um, so I try to set this up in terms of a Euthyphro dilemma, then moving on to the way Leibniz frames an argument from numbers. Does God command something because it's obligatory, or is it obligatory because he commands it? If the former, then there's some morality independent of God's say-so. If the latter, then God could with as much reason command murder as he could forbid it. Does God think that, of that 2 plus 2 equals 4, that the number 2 exists, say? Um, um, that, does he think it because 2 plus 2 equals 4? Or is it so because he thinks it? It's sort of a Euthyphro-style dilemma. Okay. Um, and, um, well, I, I suggest that, um, I suggest maybe some, some weird implications with this dilemma and, and maybe a way to, 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 to just smooth over everything. Two pages here before I present the last objection. Tell me I have one minute at least of answering this in terms of, you know, the Robert Adams, uh, uh, William Alston attempt to answer the Euthyphro dilemma about morality. Maybe we can apply that to answer this Euthyphro-style dilemma about about mathematics. I don't know if, if it works. So. But that was my strategy. Um, but I, I want, if I may, a final thought. Um, I, 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 wanna, I want to just ask how much of an audience this, um, this argument should attract. So what, what attracts planting is he spe speaks of this, this, this idea that, num that numbers are ideas as something that comes easily into the minds of his students. Um, what, what attracts his students to psychologism in the first place? I, I don't really know, but here's a little speculation. Numbers are elusive things. They strike some of us at first as not quite real, but not quite unreal either. They strike some of us as neither the in inhabitants of the material realm, nor the inhabitants of a platonic heaven. But the, not, but the mind lies somewhere between these realms. Our ideas and thoughts aren't as heavy and thick as material beings, but aren't as light and thin and distant as platonic beings either. The intellect promises to be the perfect environment for numbers. As we've seen, though, well, we didn't see now, but I, I propose this in, in framing that um, Euthyphro dilemma and the answers to it. Not, uh, well, we've seen that not just any intellect will do. Um, we need something like a divine intellect. However, once we've reached divine psychologism, the original appeal of psychologism might be risked. The divine intellect might not be much more down to earth than, than the platonic realm. If the appeal for psychologism was to avoid the mysteries of Platonism, then the divine intellect with its own mysteries might not do much better. I suggest that I focus on these sort of mysteries as they arise in respect to that, the, what, what I'd call the adams alston response to this Euthyphro dilemma. Um, is there enough resemblance between God's ideas and our own ideas to secure whatever was originally attractive about identifying numbers with ideas? Okay, one, great, wow, I didn't think I had so much. I quote Isaiah, you know, for my thoughts aren't as your thoughts. Um, so, planning as students and our audience more generally might dwindle, but the advantages and disadvantages with psychologism aren't the whole story. Whether there's a good argument to be had for the existence of God from the existence of numbers will also come down to the advantages and disadvantages of rival views that do not have numbers as dependent on the intellect at all. Excellent. What was the duck? I, it was just there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought okay. when, you, when you mentioned PowerPoints, I thought that we, you, you wanted PowerPoints. And so I, I put together PowerPoints. And I hadn't really put together so many PowerPoints before. So I got very excited <laughs> when, uh, when I got the chance to. Okay. So that's a good example of how somebody in uh, a short amount of time can lay out some very interesting material. I don't know if we could have handled any more. That was awesome. <sighs> okay. Uh, well. I'm going to run the Q&A, and I will run it with an iron fist. The iron fist that broke your iPad? That's right. <laughs> uh, our, our other 
Uh, book contributors are going to have first shot. We have some people who are specialists in this material. Uh, if, if Can you skip over them? For after that, so we're <laughs> Okay, keep your hands up for a second. Uh, Bill Craig, go ahead. The rest of you, keep your hands up. It seems to me that there are two different realisms that are on the table here that need to be teased apart, and I'd like your reaction. I think this will give Al a chance to clarify how we are to understand his view on this. On the one hand, it seems to me that low affirms the existence of abstract objects. There are abstracted, like numbers and properties and so forth, even though these depend on God's intellective activity. But if I understand Al right, his view is that there really aren't abstract objects, that what we normally think of as abstract objects are actually concrete mental events in the mind of God. So when he thinks of or uses language like God's ideas or God's concepts, He's really talking about God's thoughts, and those are very different realisms. And I'd like to know, have I interpreted you correctly, Al, in, in what I just said? I, yeah, I think so. I mean, um, the, term, the term abstract objects in more than one way. One way to think of that term is just as a sort of a, a general way of referring to numbers and properties, basically, there, but without thinking. Can you summarize that for people who couldn't hear that? Um, I wasn't listening, so. <laughs> 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 I, um, I, 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 um, I'd hardly, it would be immodest to correct um, a Plantinga's um, construal of his own view. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, take, I take him to be um, essentially agreeing with this um, point that's been made by um, Professor Craig. Um, that there is a difference between the way Lowe and Plantinga, he, construes numbers. Um, but I, um, I don't know if, if I was trading so much on that in my comparison. I really was drawing upon Lowe to try to take some of the moves and sort of maneuvers that he makes about properties, because Plantinga also presents this, number, this argument from properties. Um, trying to maybe present some sort of seam connection between them and, and use some of the moves that, that Lowe makes in his argument about numbers slash properties and apply those to, to uh, Plantinga's argument. But I don't see that those moves crucially depend on um, whether we take numbers to be abstract or whether we take them to be abstract. Um, uh, Lowe, of course, maybe, there, maybe he's... Maybe, I don't, I don't know that this is a problem. Maybe he's confused a little. When he first presented this, this argument for the existence of some concrete beings or other, that was in um, response to a paper by Peter Vanenwagen on why there's anything at all. And he tries to set it up as a way of thinking on which there, there couldn't be nothing, but there's no necessary concrete being. And, and there he certainly thinks of abstract beings in more robust ways. Um, uh, concrete beings would be spatio-temporal, abstract beings would be spaceless and timeless. So he has a spatio-temporal criterion, I think. Um, now, maybe he's changed his, maybe later on when, when, he, when he moves more in the direction of what he calls this modal ontological argument, maybe he changes his characterization or understanding of how abstract beings should be construed. Um, do you think it makes a difference to the um, viability of any of these arguments? I think that the problems you raised from Frege will apply very differently to these two types of realisms. Mm -hmm. What may be a problem for one won't necessarily be for the other. Who's, who, who is yeah, it a problem for? I was oh, okay. Here, oh. Sure I mm -hmm. uh, Liz? Oh, yeah. Um, I have a question about what you said about sets and properties depending on, sets must depend on non-sets, properties must depend on don't blame me. I don't say that. I mean, oh, I just, okay. that, that's Lowe's um, little line. Okay. 
especially if there are uninstantiated properties, could we say those are some, like the properties and sets are somewhat brute, and so then we don't need a concrete yeah. line to explain them? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't see why this. I'm, I'm, I'm not committed either way. Yeah, so far as I know, there are uninstantiated properties, uh, um, or maybe there are empty sets. That's something that would have uh, more people agreeing with it than uninstantiated properties. Or maybe I think it's a little bit um, hubristic in some way to think that there aren't other sorts of abstract beings, or at least possibly so. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, who knows? Even if in our world the only abstract beings are sets and. And, and, and properties, uh, I don't know if that's plausible, but who knows, maybe some other possible world contains some alien abstract beings we couldn't even think of, some third category. Yeah. Uh, if, if any of these, of, of this is so much as possible, I think that his arguments will, um, won't work out. But then I, I'm, I, I, I'm not so much um, interested in his, in his argument for its own sake so much as how, it's, how it can uh, bear on or shed light on. Um, the argument from numbers that's developed in this um, two dozen or so arguments for the existence of God. Okay, and Al, you have the right to jump into the queue at any point. Uh, Dan? Actually, Liz asked my question. Oh, wow. Good job, Liz. Uh, so, all right. That saves us uh, eight minutes there because Dan's been taking forever. <laughs> uh, Josh? Ask it very slowly so I don't have to field so many questions. Uh, <laughs> Are likely to have answers. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, at the end, you raised this question about that whether there's other ways to account for uh, these numbers without taking them as ideas and depending on ideas. I wonder what you might think of this possible strategy where you use this notion of aboutness as a kind of a helper. So you might think aboutness is, is sort of a, a mark of a thought. Uh, and you mentioned that. You know, if there are all these numbers and there are presumably also all these mathematical truths, you might think that these mathematical truths are about the numbers. So you have this about this plane, this role, and that could be kind of a, maybe a pathway to explore in terms of connecting um, the mathematical world with the world of thought. Try to summarize the question. Just, uh, just summarize the question. To say, to say, oh. I understand it, just... He's saying you don't speak that. <laughs> Um, so we take, um, I mean, the way I characterize it is in the mathematical truths, uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4, are, yeah, I, I say the essential ingredients are that numbers are the truth makers or something like this. What that, what, what, what our truth makers are, how you can, I mean, I don't know, um, but you want to speak about aboutness here, that the, that the, um, truths are about the numbers, and you think that aboutness is something like intentional, something mindish, and so, okay, okay, and, and so you, you can sort of wheel in a divine mind at this stage. I, w would this be a special, would this make for a, a, a special sort of mathematical argument, so to speak, for the existence of God? Can't, isn't, doesn't this aboutness this consideration apply across the board, you know, to all truths being about the objects. And if you take aboutness to be something mindish, then well, we've got we've got um, we've got a divine mind or an infinite mind or minds always on the scene. Um, so yes. I, I don't. I don't mathematical truths are nice because they have oh. strip. You know, they're, they're okay. I think are the necessary ones. Let's not give Lorraine's talk away too much. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Lorraine's talk. We'll talk about that. So that line of. Oh. Time. Okay. Well, it, seems, it seems like a question that might generalize for it for just any sort of aboutness of things. And so, but um, I'll just wait for tomorrow or so, t later today. Or Chris? So I'm wondering about, and maybe this has to do with the, the largest number problem, but um, so, and I'm wondering sort of about the connection between, between sets or collections of numbers. If you think of sets, uh, uh, collections of things, also being things that could be generated by the divine mind. So there, there are the numbers there are, right? And God is always capable of, of collecting them together. And uh, if God is also responsible for collecting, to presumably conceive all the possible sub-collections of the numbers that there are. Uh, and that number we know uh, from Cantor's theorem is going to be larger. So it seems like there's, if we suppose that, 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 that the process of God's, God's thinking the numbers sort of is static, right? So there are just the numbers there are. It all seems like it's possible for him to generate 
So either you have to say there's sort of contingently the case God thinks up to say all the numbers less than the, 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 the smallest inaccessible, but then could think of all the sub all, all the sets of those numbers, and then that gives us more numbers. And so hmm. you have to say, so God just sort of chooses to, to think all the numbers as far as he does, and could always generate more, in which case they're, these big bigger numbers are contingent. Oh, yeah. Right? In fact, they don't exist until God, they, they could have existed, but don't, in fact. That's not that's not something like the problem I had in mind. Um, I mean, I could I could speak about the problem I had in mind, and that way avoid having to answer your problem. That would be. <laughs> in fact, I'll, I'll do that. Um, so I was trying to argue from uh, unity, uh, for for the unity of this intellect, instead of instead of the um, uh, the thoughts, the numberish ideas being distributed among however many smaller intellects, we could have one intellect on the scene doing all the work. Initially, you just you know, use some sort of Occam's Radar consideration. One infinite intellect is uh, simpler maybe than a lot of, of an infinite number of smaller intellects, maybe. Um, but I had this idea of, of sort of bigger numbers including smaller numbers. And this comes through you know, with set theoretic constructions of numbers, whether you go for um, von Neumann or, or, or Zermela, you, you've got the sort of like Numbers are sort of nested in, you know, the sets are nested in sets in there. So they're sort of, and Le Leibniz too, when he defines numbers as, you know, he defines what, uh, two as one plus one, you know, one and one are two, um, three is two, two and one. There's, there's, there's sort of this idea that, that bigger numbers include littler numbers. Um, and I thought that if, if we have a being thinking of the bigger numbers, it will sort of already do all the work that, any being we introduced to think of, of um, the littler numbers would do. So those sort of beings become really otious. It's not like it's not like um, it's not just uh, the original problem, sort of a simple Occam's razor problem. Have one rather than many. It's that if you have a big enough one, it's already doing all the work that the many would do. So even if they are on the scene, we've got it. We'd have to have a have an infinite intellect encompassing the work that they're doing. Um, I, don't, I, I had the feeling that this, this thought might require there being a biggest number, though, for us to have a, a single being, you know, standing there on top, uh, thinking of that really big number and encompass, you know, and there, in, in virtue of that, thinking of the littler numbers. Um, I'm not sure of the thought altogether. Of course, we can think of big numbers without thinking of, the, you know, at least explicitly the littler numbers. I can think of a million and seven and not have in my mind 400,300 you know, 78. Um, but if the, if the being's constituting the numbers, if his, his very thought is like bringing about the number, I think that um, if anything like these set theoretic constructions or Leibnizian sort of definitions, if, if this intuition is anywhere in the right direction, um, this being must house all the numbers, so to speak. It must be an infinite intellect. Uh, maybe there's some way I can do this without requiring a biggest intellect on, on the scene. Um, but I'd have to give it some thought. Does it seem to you that, that there's some way I can work this out? Let's a biggest number on the scene. A big yeah, let's, let's, oh. You guys can follow up. Oh, OK. Sorry. After, uh, we've got other people in the queue. Evan? Uh, well, my question is actually almost exactly that question. Um, and uh, so I mean, if the divine ideas are concrete, right? And it looks as if, and if it's true, in some way or other, God has to distinctly have an idea corresponding to each of the numbers. Then we have to have, uh, first of all, a complete accountable. Uh -huh. And then there's a higher cardinality. Uh, the minor bottles. Is it is it any is there a special problem here that any Platonist or anybody who countenances the existence of numbers won't face? I mean, maybe this is a problem for all views, but why is it a special problem for this view? Well, they, they are concrete. Is, 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 an, is, this, is this infinite number of concreta any more problematic than an infinite number of abstracta? Or, you know, is this, is this number of concreta, is it, is it problematic in virtue of just how hard it is to wrap our minds around this number than it would be if, if they were if they were abstract beings? I, I wonder, I mean, I, I'm not sure, I'm not yes. sure it is, but, but, but it's one thing. Uh, oh, okay. So, uh, Robin? Okay, I have just a couple, I mean, simple questions. First of all, 
the very beginning you said um, that it was you postulated or at least Lowe's argument that um, sets properties depend on the existence of sets. So you started with sets as being primary. Is there a reason why you start with sets that like um, as no. more intuitive that no. I, I hope I didn't misrepresent him. He, he certainly doesn't think that properties, as a matter of fact, depend on the existence of sets in, in any like interesting way. I mean, the, the, the property of that, that your shirt has or that you know, some particle has that doesn't so depend that, in any way on a set. I mean, maybe in some sort of sense I there are sets. And, the OK. Um, so, so it's this. In a world without any concrete beings, OK, if there were nothing concrete, only abstract beings. The sort of axioms of foundation he has for these beings, that there can't be any empty set that, um, or pure set, that uh, sets must ultimately bar them off in non-sets. They must have non-sets as their members, or sets with, set with non-sets as their members. Um, and, that, and that properties, um, similarly, must be instantiated, and, and in particulars, ultimately. Um, if we have on the scene the only, the only non-sets being the properties, and the only um, um, particulars being the sets, then the properties will depend. The, s the properties will depend on the sets, even while the sets depend on the properties. And it doesn't mean ma we matter which way we put it. I mean, I could say that the sets will depend the properties, and the properties on the sets, or the properties on the sets, and the sets on the properties. Whichever way I first phrase it, um, this problem of circularity, this circle of dependence, will arise. <laughs> oh no! It's only those. It's only those, and they're not my premises. I mean, it's 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 Lowe's. I don't I don't mean to be defending his his no, argument just to try to use it. The other one is on the Euthyphro problem. What's oh. wrong with saying that it would just um, it's God's nature, not God's will? So you don't. Look exactly. Exactly. That's that's exactly the um, that's exactly what I propose. Uh, following, I think, the Adams and Alstonish line to try to solve this Euthyphro dilemma about um, about um, mathematics as about morality. I, I say something about it. Um, I could read what I've said, but I don't know if it would be any more enlightening or if Trent's, we'll you know. Oh, we do? Sessions. Oh, OK, so I can speak. OK. Yeah, but essentially, I think that that's maybe the way to go, though I don't know if, if it works out in either case, if the Alston Adams response to the, you know, youth of our, the original youth of our problem with morality works. Um, you know, Maybe it won't work here, but no, I don't think there's a special problem over here. I don't think there's a special. Alex, last question. Okay, I wonder if we need an actual Oh, you're Alex Proust? Oh, I'm a big fan. You won't be with us. There was this PSR on. I was going to give this um, principle of sufficient reasonish argument for one of the steps that I sort of alarded over because Trent was showing me all these numbers and <laughs> confounding me. So, so I, I wonder, do we need an actual, uh, an, an, actual, an actual existing infinite intellect? Because that's the problem. I mean, why not say, here's what we do when we prove a theorem. We have proved that every, that we have proved that the existence of an infinite intellect whose idea satisfies such and such axioms of our choice entails P. That's what we do when we prove P from those axioms. And so, we don't need there to actually be such an intellect. All we need there to be entailments about what such, a, what it would be like if there were such beings. Oh, uh, um, I don't like you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll have to think about that one. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe there's a basic disagreement about the sort of things that numbers are and that mathematics is doing here. Um, in which case, I certainly wouldn't be able to answer your question because I know nothing about that. Um, but um, if, if numbers are ideas, then you're, you're proposing that in some cases, like numbers wouldn't be ideas. When it, when it comes to Oh, I've lost my track of thought now. Um, yeah, I guess. Why don't you guys follow uh, that up and join? Maybe it's a view just that there aren't any numbers, really. But we can, but, but the stuff that mathematicians prove, you can, you can make sense of without numbers.
I don't remember what I ate for dinner last night, though it was excellent. Um, I, I don't even remember the original question because I've gotten lost in thought about it. But, but my, when you were stating it, my hunch was that it depended on a very different view about numbers that this proponent of the argument will be relying on, a ba basic sort of disagreement. Um, and I, I, I worry about how, how strong the argument will be for these sort of reasons. There's just so many views about what numbers are, where they live, whether they exist at all, that how much of an, of an audience will uh, the argument from numbers appeal to. I'm worried about that. But maybe, you know, it's a give and take. It, it, maybe even if there are other views about numbers, Maybe this psychologism has been neglected because people haven't seen the resources or that divine psychologism can offer. And um, maybe overall, even while it faces problems, maybe the other views face problems too. Even, even if this divine psychologism faces problems, maybe other basic views about numbers face bigger problems. So um, I'm not sure how it will work. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, that's good. That's very Can you good. like stop it before he asked the hard question? <laughs> I told you he wouldn't disappoint. Let's thank oh. Tyrone.